start with something totally unrelated to AMP. <laughs> so I won't be talking about anatomy and physiology this whole time. Then I'll get into kind of an intro about the skeleton. Um, so I'll talk about, I'll get, I'll get back to AMP, but probably nice to have a little break every once in a while. <laughs> Okay, so um, I know I mentioned at the beginning of the semester a little bit about some research that I do. Uh, this is basically just an encouragement for you guys to get involved in some kind of biological research during your time at Piedmont. And I'm going to try to sell you on why it matters and why it's actually beneficial. And then talk a little bit about the research that I do if you're interested in participating at all. <clears throat> Okay, so first off, why participate in research? So you probably know your professors do research aside from, uh, or a lot of your professors do research aside from teaching as well. Um, and essentially it comes down to the fact that it's gonna help you get a job or get into postgraduate school. So that's the big take home and I'll get to that in a minute. But some other kind of uh, aspects of why research can really help your career um, I know you're still probably early in your college career, but it's never too early to start thinking about your eventual career. It's going to come before you know it. Um, so first you get hands on experience in science and I know you're thinking, well, I get hands on experience in labs like the labs you take with classes, but doing an independent research project is um, actually how science is really done, I guess is the way to say it. So in labs, we have these little snippets of here's an experiment and we know how it's going to work out and these are the results and we we have nice clean data um, that's not really how it works most of the time in the real world when it comes to research so an independent research project is a great way to actually get real hands-on experience labs are a great kind of step up um, but actually working on an ongoing research project gives you a lot more hands-on experience and if you talk to any employer or um, graduate admissions committee, professional school admissions committee, they're looking for hands-on knowledge. So what you're learning in here is great. You need the base knowledge, but everyone's taking the same courses pretty much as you. Um, you may have better grades. If you don't have great grades, this is also a good way to help yourself stand out. So these are, um, any kind of research you do will give you applicable skills. It doesn't even matter what kind of research it is. As long as it's scientific research um, in some kind of scientific field, assuming you guys want to go into some form of science, which if you're in this class, you probably do um, in one form or another. So this gives you those applicable skills of asking a question, a well-developed scientific question, I should say, uh, designing and running an experiment, analyzing the results, and then answering your question. So those that's kind of the trajectory, as you know, um, of the scientific process. And that applies across all different fields, whether it's human health related or um, more ecology related, which is kind of what I do. So applicable skills. And like I said at the beginning, this is going to help you stand out when you're applying for jobs. So I know you're not applying for jobs probably very soon, maybe some summer jobs. Um, but if you're applying for jobs in any kind of scientific field, having even one line on your resume that says independent research project, worked with professor so-and-so, and then a title of your research project that you worked on looks really good and definitely helps you stand out um, in a, a very crowded field, I would say. There's gonna be maybe 10 other people applying, at least maybe, I don't know, depending on what you apply for, 10 other people applying for the same job as you. They've had the same classes. Maybe they have about the same grades, um, having this one line on your resume can really help your resume stand out. So you're put in the um, request an interview pile versus the no pile. Uh, so that's kind of the goal. Obviously, gaining the skills is the main goal, uh, but a more tangible goal for you guys is probably the fact that it will help you potentially get into a postgraduate program, professional school, or a job. Okay, so some uh, kind of nuts and bolts of how to do this at Piedmont. I don't know if you guys have heard this. Sorry if this is really um, repetitive, 
but there's kind of a couple different ways you can go about it. So you can sign up for course credit. So you, if you need an extra hour of credit for some reason, you can sign up for Natural Science 2980 or if you qualify for the honors program, and I don't remember what those qualifications are off the top of my head, a certain GPA I know is included, um, you can sign up for the honors version. So you can get an hour of credit. It'll be about an hour's worth of work a week. That's the idea throughout the semester. Um, it'll show up on your transcript as an independent research project. Um, and then obviously you'll put it on your resume. If you don't wanna commit that much, so you'll end up getting a grade for that. Um, you don't really have tests. It's more, again, it's applied. You're actually using the knowledge that you have and skills to create something, to create an experiment, to create a poster or whatever it is by the end. Um, you can also do it for, for no credit. If you just wanna work with a professor, you don't really have time to commit an hour a week or something more formal. You can just go talk to a professor and say, I really wanna get some research experience. Um, they're probably gonna be more than happy to work with you. Um, and you can still put that line on your resume. Just because it's not on your transcript doesn't mean it can't go on your resume. You can still have that research experience on your resume, even if you don't really have room for it in your schedule. I know you guys are super busy, so um, that's an option as well. And I'm talking about this now because before we know it, registration is going to be here for fall semester, which seems insane. It always seems like it gets earlier and earlier, but we're almost at the halfway point for this semester. Um, so registration for fall 2021, as a reminder, begins March 22nd. That's for seniors, so you guys might be a couple days later. Um, so this is the time to kind of start thinking about it. If you think you might want to do some research, even if it's not for this fall or the summer, I guess you could register for it for the summer as well, potentially. Um, next spring, the following fall, something like that. Start thinking about it now. I'm just trying to get your, your wheels spinning. Our goal as professors is to really help you get skills that will help you get a great job. That's what we want. So this is going to help um, immensely. Okay, so now <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do. I kind of mentioned this at the beginning of the class beginning of the semester. Um, I don't do anything with humans. Uh, humans are kind of a pain to work with because there's all this paperwork and you know you have to be careful not to injure them, etc. So I actually do work in invertebrate ecology and I know most of you guys are like, I don't care about bugs. I'm not going to work in invertebrate ecology. How is this going to help me get a job in some kind of human health, right? Um, but I will say the topic of research doesn't really matter so much as the overall skills that you gain. So being, like I said, being able to ask a question, develop an experiment, analyze the data. Analysis of data is huge. Analysis of data is essentially the same no matter what kind of data you're looking at. So, and then drawing conclusions from that data. So those skills apply across any scientific discipline. So you can apply them to invertebrate ecology. You can apply them to physical therapy research. You can apply them to infectious disease research. It's the same skills, you just apply them to different topics. So invertebrate ecology research um, could still potentially be useful to you, even though it's not necessarily a topic that you think you'll go into. It does allow you to get outside, which is nice if you like being outside. So I'm just gonna introduce a few kind of really general questions about what I look at. I do have one public health related concern with mosquitoes. Uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, but if any of these sound interesting to you, even just a little bit, feel free to come talk to me after class, during office hours, whenever, even if it's not this semester in the future, just keep it in mind. Um, I'm still kind of working on getting my research program up and going here. So this is my first year at Piedmont. Um, but generally what I do is I work in streams and wetlands and I see what bugs are there. I love being around water, in water, outside, so that's kind of my main goal. That's sort of what drove me into this area. And if you had told me 20 years ago that I'd be studying bugs, I would have said, you're absolutely insane. So I don't really, I mean, I know how I got here, but it was kind of a weird kind of roundabout path that took me to invertebrate ecology. So streams and wetlands are what I focus on. There's an excellent habitat right out the back door here. So you don't even, we don't have to go that far. There are infinite questions that can be asked about that wetland if you walk across the bridge to Swanson, which you've probably done a million times. Um, there's a wetland, there's a creek, there's uh, beaver dams, there's floodplain, there's all kinds of habitats out there that are 
uh, perfect for research projects. So right in our backyard. So a few very general areas, if this gets you kind of thinking, um, just to give you an idea of what I do, I guess. Uh, so at the very simplest level, what bugs are living in a certain habitat? This is a really easy way to get started. So even within, so this is a cypress swamp in South Georgia where I worked um, for my PhD work. Even within that tiny little flooded area, there's probably 10 microhabitats where different kinds of bugs live and interact with each other. So um, just doing kind of a basic survey of what is living where and why. And then off of this question, there's probably 20 other questions you can ask. So that's just a very kind of baseline question. Um, I'm also interested in looking at interactions. So I think interactions between different organisms are fascinating. Uh, what's eating what, what's competing with what. I don't know if you guys are aware, but drag, this is a, a young dragonfly. So before a dragonfly becomes the dragonflies that you know as adults, they live in the water um, for up to two years sometimes. So they'll be in the water for two years looking like this without wings. They look nothing like the dragonflies that you know, and they're really voracious predators. So they eat a ton of different stuff. In this case, this dragonfly is eating a fish. So an invertebrate eating a vertebrate. I find that fascinating that the, the tables are kind of flipped. Um, so stuff like that is really interesting to me. And then also on the Here's a public health aspect. <laughs> so dealing with humans indirectly, biological control of mosquitoes in wetlands. So you guys are probably aware, no one really likes mosquitoes, um, but they're also really deadly. So they're, I think, the, I think they consider them the deadliest animal in the world because they transmit so many deadly diseases, malaria being the biggest one. Um, it's the second most deadly communicable disease in the world behind tuberculosis. So, and mosquitoes are spreading malaria. We don't have malaria in the US. It's really prevalent in developing nations. We do have Zika and we have West Nile virus, which are spreading uh, throughout the Southeast, also transmitted by mosquitoes. Young mosquitoes, similar to young dragonflies, live in the water before they become adults and go bite people and spread these diseases. So controlling them at this level is the ideal because then they don't have a chance to actually spread any diseases. Um, so we can spread pests, we can spray pesticides, kill all the mosquitoes, and then you have all these chemicals in the environment, right? So we try to avoid that as much as possible. And to do that, we use something called biological control, basically something that eats those mosquitoes. Let's increase how many of those there are. So we decrease the mosquito population. And this beetle here is a predaceous diving beetle. Um, it eats mosquitoes. It's a voracious predator as well. So it's being looked at to actually help control mosquito populations. And there's a lot of other types of bugs that eat mosquitoes too. So controlling mosquito populations is a huge public health focus. If you're interested in public health at all, that's a great project to potentially um, jump into. All right, so those are my kind of uh, the biggest part of what I do in my research area. If you are not interested in being outside and don't really like getting muddy and dirty, I'm actually still collaborating with the school I used to work at in New York, the State University of New York um, on forest ecology stuff. So getting out of the water and into the forest um, with non-native invasive insects. So these non-native invasive insects are basically decimating populations of trees in New York, as well as down here. So there's a couple that we're looking at specifically, emerald ash borer, they're killing ash trees. Ash trees are all over. So the green is the, the range of ash trees, the red dots are where there's this beetle that's killing them. So it is, they reach down into Georgia here. So here we have, emerald ash borer in Georgia, and they're continuing to spread along with hemlock woolly adelgid. Does anyone know, are you familiar with hemlock trees? Anyone? Okay, so hemlock trees are really prevalent up here in the mountains of North Georgia. They, if you, you've seen them, you probably just haven't recognized them. If you see an evergreen tree with really tiny needles, that's a hemlock tree. So they uh, primarily grow in ravines, uh, kind of canyons along streams. 
they help shade the streams, they keep the streams cool, um, and then contribute a lot of other stuff to the streams as well. But they're really critical and they're being, they're basically dying off throughout the Eastern US because of this little bug called the hemlock, whoops, sorry guys, on Zoom, I didn't go forward, called the hemlock woolly adelgid. It doesn't even look like a bug. It's a little tiny sap sucking insect that lives in these kind of woolly little homes. It's like, uh, that's why they're called woolly adelgid. So they're sucking the sap out of the tree, the trees die, and then it changes the whole ecology of the forest, similar to when ash trees die. So most of this work, um, they're going to be sending me samples, essentially. So this will be mostly lab-based work um, and part of a larger project, which can also look good um, on a resume being part of kind of a across the East Coast collaborative project. And what they're looking at specifically up in New York is a, a really unique wetland that is just now being invaded by these insects. So looking at how that changes the ecology of the forest. Okay, so that kind of wraps up what I do. If any of that is even kind of of interest to you, like I said, now in the future, please come talk to me. Um, I'm happy to talk about any projects kind of in that area, even if you think it's not related at all to what you do, but you want to do some kind of research um, in my lab, I'm happy to explore options. No matter what, try to get research experience before you leave. I think it's really going to help you um, in the long run for kind of your next step after college. All right. So that's that. <laughs> Thanks for letting me talk about research. Um, a little bit of a break from AMP there. Any questions? Sorry, I should ask questions. I should ask for questions. <laughs> no? Okay. I know it's a long shot in an AMP class, so you guys would be interested in that, but just keep it in mind for future reference. All right. There we go. Now, skeleton. Okay, so how I'm going to do this chapter, rather than going through and saying, saying the name of each bone in the body, which is extremely boring, um, I'm going to do a little intro here with information beyond just the names of the bones. So you guys will be responsible for learning the bones. And on Monday, we're going to do, like we did for histology, a Jeopardy. So. Um, you guys in here will be on Zoom, so we'll, we'll flip compared to how it was last time. So you guys on Zoom will be in person. You can use your notes. Um, your outline is due Monday for this chapter. So you will have hopefully already looked at the chapter, chapter eight, and learned at least be kind of familiar with where different bones are. So we'll group up. It'll be for bonus points again on the test. So we actually have two chunks of bonus points going into the next exam which is good. It's a tough exam. Um, so I'm comfortable with offering that many bonus points, but just bring your notes, be ready to answer questions with um, a team again. Okay, so this is gonna be, like I said here, an overview of the skeleton, adding some additional information that you need to know beyond just what bone is what. Um, so that you can, Kind of learn on your own and in lab over the next two weeks we're going to be learning the skeleton so we'll be doing the well half basically half of the skeleton each week so you'll have a lot of time to learn this um, you'll see this material a lot which is a good thing it's a lot of yeah it's a lot of bones there's 206 bones in total that you will learn the names to or attempt to learn the names to <clears throat> And then in lab, you'll be able to see an actual model of a skeleton and look at the different parts, parts of the skeleton as well, which will be really helpful. Okay, so jumping into the skeleton, 206 bones in the skeleton. And we typically break it into kind of this, um, the axial versus what we call the appendicular skeleton. So the axial skeleton is the axis of your body. So it's your head and trunk, essentially. So that's going to include the skull, 
the vertebral column, the rib cage, the sternum, and then yeah, the, the sacrum and the hyoid is a bone in the neck. So that's going to be the axial skeleton. The beige color here is the axial skeleton. That's what we'll do in lab this week. And then the next week we'll be covering the appendicular skeleton. In lecture, we're just going to do it kind of all at once. So the appendicular skeleton are the appendages that are attached to the body, arms and legs, and then the pieces that actually attach the arms and legs to the trunk, which would be the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle. I'll talk about which, what each of those are. So arms, legs, pectoral girdle, pelvic girdle, that is going to be the appendicular skeleton, which is in green here. So everything that's colored green is appendicular. Okay. So I'm going to start with some uh, basics about the skull. As the skull is very complicated. Um, it actually has 22 bones in total which we kind of think of our skull as just one bone. There's 22, um, a lot of them are facial bones. So there's cranial bones and there's facial bones. They're joined together by joints. We don't think of our head as having joints, but these bones are joined together by immovable joints called sutures. There's also a number of cavities within the within the skull. Obviously the cranial cavity where our brain is, is a pretty big cavity. The orbits or the eye sockets, those are considered cavities. Nasal cavity, oral cavity, um, the inner and middle ear cavities, and then the sinuses, so paranasal sinuses. So cavities basically around the nose. Most of the other parts of the body don't really have cavities like this. This part of the skeleton has a lot of just open area. All right, along with all of those bones, there are a lot of little holes in the skull. And I mentioned this term already and said it would come back up when we talk about a skeleton. These are foramina. The singular is foramen. You'll see both of those words a ton when you're learning the different parts of the skull um, in, the, in the lecture text as well as the lab book. These are just holes that allow for passage of blood vessels and nerves into and out of the brain. So we need holes in the skull because we need blood vessels and nerves to actually access the brain. So you'll see a lot of foramen and foramina. The paranasal sinuses, I think most people kind of know where your sinuses are. There's actually four different groups of them and they're paired. There's one on kind of either half of the face. So you have on the top here, and these are just, um, open pockets, basically mucous membrane lined pockets. You have the frontal sinuses, which are sort of right above your eyebrows. And these sinus names, they sound other than frontal, probably sound weird. They're, when you learn the bones of the cranium, you'll realize that there's a sphenoid bone, ethmoid, and maxillary. So they're all associated, the sinuses are associated or named based off of the bones that they're near. So the frontal sinus, ethmoid sinus is kind of on the upper part of the bridge of your nose on either side. Um, you have the maxillary sinus, which the maxilla is your upper jaw. So maxillary sinus is right above your upper jaw. And then the sphenoid sinus, that last one, is actually back in the head a little bit further, right above the ear. The main purpose of sinuses is to just 
um, lighten the skull. So they're just openings, so it's not just all dense bone. It lightens the skull. I don't know that adding resonance to the voice is a purpose of them, but it's an effect. So it actually affects how you talk. And if your sinuses are clogged up, you know you sound different, right? <laughs> you sound a little bit all stuffy. So it can affect how your voice sounds. So looking at the cranium specifically, there's eight cranial bones. The rest of the bones are gonna be facial bones. So all this white here, um, those are facial bones. Those are where it gets a little confusing. The cranial bones are not really all that bad. I'm not gonna go through these because this is what you're gonna learn on your own and prepare for um, Jeopardy on Monday. Um, but just that's a list of the eight cranial bones. Um, and I don't think I actually have a list of the facial bones, but there's uh, quite a few of them as well. Okay. What I wanna talk about now is actually the, I put this up here because I wanna talk about the sutures between these bones, which is, it's not a bone that you need to learn, but it's an important aspect of the skull that you need to know. So these sutures are the joints between the bones. They're immovable joints, but they are considered joints because it's two bones coming together. So right across or down the middle of your head, these are called the parietal bones on either side of your head. You have the sagittal suture. So the sagittal suture runs lengthwise across the top of your skull and is between the parietal bones. So you wanna be able to identify these sutures um, on a diagram, as well as be able to tell me what bones they essentially border or join. Okay, so sagittal suture, the sagittal plane of the body, right? Same idea. So some of these, well, actually most, a lot of these, uh, yeah. Some of these terms will seem familiar. Coronal, same thing. A coronal plane of the body is if you cut the body and you have a front and back half, or yeah, anterior and posterior. So the coronal suture uh, separates the frontal bone from the parietal. So here we're looking at the top of the head. You have those two parietal bones, the sagittal suture, the front, uh, the coronal suture separates that frontal bone, which is your forehead essentially from those two bones behind it. So it runs kind of up and around like a, almost like a crown, I guess. Coronal means crown. So similar to that around the front of that, of your skull. So coronal suture. And then on the back of your head, you have um, the lambdoid suture. It's called that because it kind of looks like the Greek letter lambda, but that doesn't really help me all that much. If it helps you, awesome. So the lambdoid suture runs across the back of your skull, separating the occipital bone from the two parietal bones. lambdoid suture and then the I think the last one I'm going to talk about is the squamous suture. Squamous is a suture basically right above um, your ear. It's going to separate that parietal bone from the bone below it which is the temporal bone. So like I said, for those sutures, you wanna know the names, be able to identify them if I point them out on a diagram, and then be able to tell me what bones they're actually between. Okay. And the skull actually changes as a child is developing from infancy into adulthood. Obviously, when you're little, you had a much smaller skull, right? Infants have smaller skulls than um, older children and adults do. A way for to allow that skull to grow is to basically have these kind of soft areas that don't have bone formed yet. And these are called fontanelles. There's spaces between unfused cranial bones um, in infants and young children. 
And here you can see, so you have the parietal bones and the frontal bone. Um, there's this kind of membranous section where there's no skull. So if you've ever touched the front of a baby's head, it's kind of freaky, like an infant, you can kind of push down a little bit on the fontanelle um, and the brain is just below that. So there's no skull actually protecting that part of the brain. There's one in the front fontanelle and then one in the back of the skull as well. So it allows for growth of the, of the brain and the skull. And it also allows for during uh, birth, it allows for the skull to kind of squish in a little bit to be able to get out of the birth canal. These bones are typically fused by the time a child is six um, and then full, the skull size gets to its full capacity by about eight or nine years old. <clears throat> All right, so those are the fontanelles. Now into the vertebral column. So an overview of the vertebral column. Uh, we typically divide the, the spine into a few different sections and I'll talk about each of those briefly here. The general features include the fact that there are 33 vertebra. So 33 bones, some of which are fused together. Um, and in between most of those, the ones in between the ones that aren't fused, there are intervertebral discs. So there's discs in between each of the vertebral bones. And I'll talk about those in just a second. So you have a vertebral bone and then a disc, vertebral bone, disc. So these little light blue things in here on the diagram are the discs. We separate the spine into five different groups. The neck, which are the cervical vertebra, they're abbreviated with a C, and then the number starting with the top one being one. So C1, C2, all the way through C7. So there's seven cervical vertebra in the neck. In the thoracic region, there are 12 vertebrae. These are what the ribs attach to. So you have 12 ribs that attach one to each of those vertebrae. Um, in the lower back, the lumbar region, there are five. And then we get into this section, a couple sections of fused vertebrae. So there are five fused vertebrae in the sacral region. So it's this bony looking plate. These were um, once separate, but then fuse over time as an individual gets older. So that's the sacrum. And then at the very end, you have your tailbone that is made up of four fused bones, four fused coccygeal bones. So your tailbone is also called the coccyx. So that makes up the 33 vertebrae. So here you have the coccygeal bones fused. Okay, so you're gonna to wanna to know how many vertebrae are in each of those sections um, and the names of the sections, so what we call them. And you guys know all the body regions, right? So we knew cervical, you know, cervical relates to the neck, lumbar, lower back, I guess sacral, I don't think we went into, that's probably new. Thoracic, obviously the chest. So some of that terminology that I said, it's gonna come back up and it's gonna help if you just know it to start with um, is coming back up now. Okay. I wanna talk a little bit about what each vertebra looks like. They are really weird bones. So they're each individual bones. They fit into that irregular bone shape category for obvious reasons. They are very irregularly shaped. Um, so you have, you don't have to know everything, well, you have to know most of what's listed on this diagram here, but the information that you need to know and be able to point out on a diagram, I have in these bullet points here. So if there's anything in a diagram that I haven't listed specifically, you don't need to know that term. 
Okay, so let's get into it. So the body of the vertebrae, vertebra, is the big part. That's the weight-bearing portion. So that's what supports the weight of everything above it. Here we have our first foramina, foramen, or foramina, um, the vertebral foramina. So if we're just talking about one, it's a vertebral foramen. So if we're just talking about this one bone, that's the big hole where the spinal cord goes through. So that's the vertebral foramen. When the uh, vertebrae are stacked on top of each other, the spinal cord, it creates the spinal, um, the spinal column, basically, the canal. So it allows the spinal cord to uh, basically be, be protected by the vertebrae and run up and down the length of the body. So that's the vertebral foramina. Um, and then there's a few different processes, which just means little pieces sticking off of the vertebra. So you have the spinous process off the back. So this is this will be uh, the back side of the body and the front side of the body. So if you feel your spine, you can feel those individual spinous processes. So when you feel those little not, uh, like nubs, I guess, on your spine, those are the spinous processes on the back side. Um, yeah, the bump that's visible under the skin. That's what you're seeing, the spinous process. The transverse process, transverse just means, um, well, kind of off to the side. So transverse processes are coming off the sides here of the vertebra. So here we have the transverse process for you guys on Zoom. That's going to extend laterally out. And then you have um, the last feature. I think the last feature that I want to talk about is the articular facet. So remember, when you see articular or articulate, that means two things are fitting together, kind of like a joint. Well, it is a joint. So the articular facets here, you can see them here. They have a little bit of cartilage on them. That's where the where two vertebral bones are gonna stack and fit together and articulate with each other. So they can move a little bit separately from each other, not too much. Um, and that's where they're gonna articulate and fit together. So here you have the articular facets. And these are the superior because they're on top. So. These are going to articulate with the vertebra above it. There's also inferior ones, which will articulate, obviously, because we have a stack of vertebra with the, the bone below it. Okay, I think that's all that I want you to know about the structure of a vertebra. All right, and then the discs. So you guys probably knew you had discs in between your bones, in between your vertebral bones. You probably heard of someone having, someone having a slip disc or a herniated disc. Uh, so these are essentially um, discs that help bind the vertebrae together, and they also help with shock absorption. So if you do any kind of kind of high impact ex exercise like running, if you didn't have these discs in between your vertebral bones, your bones would just be hitting each other. That is painful and damaging to the bones. So these discs in between just kind of cushion any kind of impact between those uh, vertebral bones. So they help absorb shock. Yeah, so a herniated disc, ruptured, slipped, whatever you wanna call it, it's all kind of the same. It can be slightly different, but for the most part, basically means part of this disc is squishing out and putting pressure on the nerves that are running through that vertebral foramen, so your spinal cord. So the disc part of it um, has kind of ruptured and extends out, putting pressure onto spinal nerves, which is what's causing that pain. And I assume it's very painful. And I have heard it's very painful. So that's when you hear someone has a ruptured disc, that's what it means. Okay. And there's only 23 intervertebral discs. There's no discs in between the fused vertebrae, obviously. It's only between the free ones.
Okay, so now a little bit about some specific vertebrae that I want you to be familiar with. The ones in the neck are particularly important. Um, so I want to talk about C1, C2, and C7. So C1 and C2 are obviously the first two vertebrae down from your skull. Um, C1 is called the atlas. And I don't know if it's Greek or Roman mythology, I can't remember, but atlas is the guy who's holding the world on his shoulders. So your atlas is holding your head up. That's why it's called that. It also is the vertebrae that allows you to nod your head yes. So you can do this because you have a very specifically formed atlas. The one right below that, the C2, is called the axis. It allows you to shake your head no. So these two are what basically allow you to say yes and no. And then they articulate together um, to allow both of those to happen kind of seamlessly. So here on top, we have the atlas and then the axis kind of fits up into it. So it has this little portion that connects almost like a puzzle piece. So you wanna know C1 and C2, that they're the atlas and the axis and what they allow for. Um, and then C7, so that's your last cervical vertebra. It's called the vertebra prominence. It has, because it has a prominent spinous process. So if you feel kind of the lower part of your neck in the back, you should feel a really obvious spinous process sticking out. That's your C7 vertebra. That's the spinous process sticking out the back of your C7 vertebra. All right, so those are three specific vertebrae that you need to be familiar with. And next, um, the spine is not always perfectly, well, it's not perfectly straight. It has some natural curvature to it. Um, abnormal curvature can happen as a result of uh, some kind of genetic defect, um, injury, mal misuse basically. So if you don't use it enough or if you have poor posture, let's say disease already, it can be disease, paralysis. So there's a lot of different things that can happen that can cause your spine to kind of be out of whack and curved a little funny. You guys have probably all heard of scoliosis. I think they still do scoliosis tests in school. I remember bending over and having a teacher like rub my spine to see if it was curved. I don't know if they still do that. I don't know why they do it in school. I feel like doctors should <laughs> would do that. Anyway, scoliosis is where you have an abnormal lateral curvature of your spine. This is usually um, uh, genetic or congenital. So it happens. Um, it's not something that can kind of be, that can be prevented. And it's easy to pick up in children. So you can see if they have a lateral curvature. So here we have scoliosis. The spine curves off to the side a little bit, right? So that's lateral off to the side. Um, then you have kyphosis and lordosis. Kyphosis is, causes a hunchback stature. It's an exaggerated bend in the thoracic region. So if you do this a lot, if you're like on your phones or on your computer, you can actually cause yourself to have a kyphosis or if you don't stand up straight, if you kind of hunch over a lot. Over time, you can have, you can cause your spine to kind of sort of bend in that way and then it makes it even harder to stand up straight. So practice good posture. <laughs> um, other things can cause that as well. Uh, but our our society now because we're so focused on computers and phones a lot of times having our shoulders hunched forward and kind of curled forward is causing an increase in kyphosis so pull your shoulders back and stand up straight just remember that <laughs> every once in a while it's easy to forget and then lordosis is in the lumbar region so bottom of the spine and that's an exaggerated kind of forward curvature this happens a lot in um, pregnant women or women who have been pregnant recently because there's a lot of weight in the lower stomach, obviously with the baby, the fetus developing and it can cause um, excess pressure on the lower spine and cause that kind of sway back posture. Or people who are just, if they're generally overweight and have a lot of extra weight in their stomach, so not just pregnant women. Okay, so those are the abnormal, three abnormal spinal curvatures that you wanna be familiar with. Now let's talk briefly about the ribs. 
you have 12 ribs. Um, you have true ribs and false ribs. So true ribs are ones that are connected directly to the sternum. So the back of your ribs are connected to your spine. The fronts of your ribs, of the first seven at least, are connected to your sternum or your breastbone. So you can see here one through seven have a direct connection. This blue stuff here is cartilage. So the bone doesn't connect directly to bone, but you have the bone of the rib and then cartilage on the end connecting to the sternum. Either way, one through seven are directly connected to the sternum. So for you guys on Zoom, you can see number seven still directly connects up to the sternum. Eight through 12 are connected to the rib above, and then that connects to the sternum. So it's an indirect connection. So here, if we're looking at rib eight, it's connected to rib seven, which is then connected to the sternum. So eight connects to seven, that connects to the sternum. So that's the, the true versus false difference. And then at the very bottom, ribs 11 and 12 are specifically called floating ribs. So they have no connection to the sternum. So they're down here just hanging out by themselves, not connected at all to the sternum. And they're really easy to break for that reason. So 11 and 12 down here, those are your floating ribs. They're just floating in space. Okay, and we'll stop there for today. I'll cover this either, I'll cover the rest of it on um, Monday or Wednesday. Uh, but Monday, we're definitely doing Jeopardy. So bring in notes you have on the skeleton. It'll be focused on specific bones and identifying different bones of the body. Thank <laughs> you.